Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, What's New in ICD-10-CM. This is Sharon Byron from TrueCode, and I'm joined today by, Lori, uh, by Joy King Ewing, TrueCode consultant. We are thrilled that you're able to join us for what is one of our most popular webinars every year. So thanks for joining us, and we're glad you're here. So for those who might be unfamiliar with TrueCode, um, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about us. TrueCode offers an encoder application that is used by hundreds of hospitals, consulting firms, payers. I think if you asked any one of our customers what sets us apart, they'd probably tell you uh, one of three things. They'd say TrueCode's super easy to use. Um, it um, lets you code quickly and accurately with pertinent coding references uh, that are presented as you code. Um, the software is super intuitive, and our customer support is second to none. And as an added bonus, we often deliver significant savings compared to other encoders. So if you're interested in seeing TrueCode in action, we'd love for you to join an upcoming demonstration, and you can register for one of those on our website. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Joy King Ewing. Joy is past president of the Alabama Health Information Management Association. She's a distinguished member of the organization for 2003, and she's held several positions on that board. She owns Joy King Consulting, and she also conducts coding and CDI audits for inpatient hospitals. She works as an inpatient contractor with administrative consultant services, as well as with TrueCode. She offers presentations on coding, clinical documentation, and other topics related to coding and healthcare reimbursement. And she's spoken at multiple state and national meetings on a variety of topics. So we're thrilled to have her here and present this topic for us. And before I hand it over to, her, to Joy, I want to review a few things um, about how this webinar will work and about how you'll get your CEUs. Uh, first, you're all in listen-only mode, so that means you'll need to use your control panel to communicate. This is on the right-hand side of your screen. You can minimize that um, to get it out of the way or, by, or collapse and expand the components of it by clicking on the little red box with the arrow. If you want to ask a question, you can do that in the questions section of the control panel, which is towards the bottom. So just click on the little plus button. That will open up a text box, and you can type your question in there. Um, we will try to answer questions at the end of the webinar, and if we don't get to them, um, please still submit your question, and we'll follow up. Um, Joy has offered to follow up after the webinar to answer those. Uh, there are handouts that are in the handout section of the control panel. They were also emailed in a previous email in the reminder email, so hopefully you had a chance to download those. And lastly, um, in order to receive your CEUs, we ask that you complete a brief evaluation. So I'll be sharing the link to that evaluation at the conclusion of this webinar, um, but don't worry about copying it down. If you miss it, we'll also be sending an email out tomorrow that will contain a link um, to that evaluation. Once you submit it, you can download your CEU certificate. And if you have any questions or problems accessing your certificate, feel free to email me by responding to the email you received about this webinar. Those will all go to me. All right, with that, I am going to hand it over to Joy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Sharon, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to walk you through the um, coding changes for I-10-CM and the coding guidelines that will go into effect October 1. And I'm going to touch briefly at the very end of the presentation on a few things from the IPPS um, final rule for fiscal year 21 as well. I don't know that I'll have a lot of time to talk about that, but I did have a couple of things that I wanted to mention about that as well. So the first uh, slide that you see here is just sort of a summary of the changes in the codes. As you know, um, over the last couple of years in particular, um, they have been doing a cleanup in the coding classification and you know correcting errors and things like that. And one of the main things that you're going to see um, me talk about as we go through this presentation today is changes with excludes one and excludes two notes. If you remember back in uh, 2015, I think it was, we had some problems with some things that needed to be coded together, but there was an excludes one blocking that from being possible. And they came out with sort of an interim advice about that, that if you had things that were not um, related to each other, that it was okay to code them together. For example, a, a bacterial pneumonia and a, an aspiration pneumonia and things like that. 
one of the current issues that we have right now in that area is emphysema and COPD because they decided a couple of years ago that we need to code the J43.9 code whenever emphysema is documented, but it does not allow us to also code the COPD exacerbation code, J44.1. And unfortunately, with all the fixes for this year, they did not fix that particular issue. But there are a lot of things that they have done that I'll talk about as we go through where they have changed either a whole excludes one note to an excludes two or taken certain diagnoses out of that excludes one note and made them an excludes two note. And just as a reminder of what that means is if clinically both what's in the excludes one note or the code classification in the excludes two note are there, if it's clinically um, present and feasible on that particular case, you do are, you are able to code those together. So it's, it's good news in a lot of ways with some of the things that they've done that we can code things together that they find clinically often do present at the same time. The other thing that I was just going to say, if you happen to have an encoder that does not allow you to see all the instructional notes in the in the alpha index in the tabular, you're a little bit at a disadvantage with some of these changes that are being made. And I just want to remind everyone, I think sometimes coders forget that the notes that are in the classification itself actually take precedence over the both the official coding guidelines and coding clinic references. So I do feel like it's really important for you to be able to stay up on top of the changes that get made in all these instructional notes because that has a lot to do not only with accurate coding, but in some cases it can actually help you when you're trying to fight a payer denial. So as you can see from this slide, we had 490 additions and 58 deletions in the codes and then 47 revisions. 30 of the new codes were MCCs, 96 were CCs, and then we basically have 364 new codes that are neither one. And you can see from this little table here where the majority of a lot of the changes uh, occurred. The blood stuff we're going to talk about, there's a lot of changes there in particular. And then, of course, when you get into the musculoskeletal and the injuries and poisoning, you know, it takes a lot of changes to cover all the different body parts and all that kind of stuff. But at any rate, that gives you a little bit of an idea of where the changes have occurred. So the first guideline that I want to talk about is just this addition to the one that came out before um, about social determinants of health. They've added that second bullet point that's in bold about the fact that if patients self-report documentation uh, about social determinants, which often they might do, that you are able to code those as long as the patient's information has been signed off by the health care provider and incorporated into that health record. They also came out with coding clinic advice in 2019 about that issue. So starting with the first chapter, and I've done this by chapter, um, the infectious diseases, we have a couple of new um, tick-borne um, problems. The first one is this um, tick-borne viral encephalitis. And the first thing you see there is that Powassan virus disease. And then you have the other tick-borne viral encephalitis, both of which are MCCs. A little bit about the Powassan virus disease. It is caused by an infected tick bite. And a lot of times patients don't develop symptoms immediately, um, but it is considered a pretty serious disease. And it often or usually does result in encephalitis or men meningitis, which as you know, are pretty serious. And it can lead to death. It also, can be transmitted by blood transfusions collected from infected donors. And if, say, the blood was in, taken from the donor before they showed symptoms, then it could be infected. And so one of the reasons for asking for this additional code, not only do they want to be able to track these patients that are developing this, but they want to make sure that they can monitor the safety of the blood supply that's out there as well. Then we have, as you can see, an excludes one note that was added under B34.2 to refer us to the new COVID-19 code of U07.1. And then we have babesiosis um, that was already present, but they've expanded that code to give us um, more specificity about the different genuses or g different species of that particular tick-borne disease. Um, a lot of these are also um, asymptomatic and sometimes are never actually diagnosed. Uh, 
um, so it can per persist undetected. And so again, it represents, um, you know, a threat to people that are giving blood because they often are asymptomatic carriers and they want to make sure that they can track that and keep the blood supply safe. So another reason for getting that new set of codes and that expansion of the babesiosis are CCs. Then we start into the coronavirus guidelines and I'm just going to kind of touch briefly on these. Hopefully you have seen all of these. Um, they came out in April and then they came back out in some revisions in August. I hope that you have seen the frequently asked questions that came out on August the 5th because they did make some changes to the guidelines that had come out originally and those changes are reflected in what we're looking here that go into effect for October 1. Uh, just with like HIV for example we only code confirmed cases of COVID-19 and they did explain about um, what confirmation actually means the confirmation does not require documentation of the positive test result for COVID-19. If the physician documents that the patient has it, that's sufficient. Also, just with like with AIDS, we're not going to code suspected possible, probable, or inconclusive COVID to the U07. Instead, you would be coding out the signs and symptoms that were reported for that patient. Sequencing of codes, um, obviously the U07 is going to come first if it meets the definition of principal diagnosis in a confirmed case. There are some ch exceptions to that, that like the OB cases, for example, or newborn cases where those guidelines are going to take precedence. And you can see that it's referred you to those other guidelines if there are some changes in how the sequencing would occur. But the U07 would come first and then any manifestations would obviously be coded as secondary diagnoses. And then they go into acute respiratory manifestations of COVID-19 and they made some changes in this area as well from the ones that were in effect that are actually in effect until September 30th. For a pneumonia patient related to COVID, you would be coding the U07 as principal and then the J1289, other viral pneumonia as the um, manifestation code. And then for acute bronchitis, it's basically telling you that you're going to use the U07 and then the J20.8. If they diagnose bronchitis that it's not specified as acute, then you would use this J40 code here. And if they just document a lower respiratory infection um, or an acute respiratory infection in OS, then the J22 code is what they are recommending that you use. If COVID-19 is documented as being associated with a respiratory infection in OS, then they have this J98.8 code that should be assigned. Um, ARDS, they've got a guideline too. I think this is one of the additions that they added um, where you would code the U07 and the J80. And one of the things that I heard a couple of months going into the pandemic was that they originally thought that COVID was causing all these patients to have pneumonia, but what they found that in fact, many of them were going into ARDS, um, which is explaining why many of them were on the vent for such long periods of time and a lot of fatalities, because ARDS, as you know, is a very um, serious condition that does often lead to, to death. So that was kind of an interesting little fact that I heard from some of the physicians that were talking about this. For acute respiratory failure, we're obviously going to use those J96.0 codes um, as secondary diagnoses. And then for non-respiratory manifestations, you're going to use the 07 code, and then you're going to assign whatever you know, manifestations the doctor has documented as additional diagnoses. This is also another area that, that changed in the FAQs that came out, they made some revisions to what had originally come out in this particular area. And basically what they're saying is that for both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients, um, you're gonna be using that Z20.828 code for the most part. For screening, um, they also had originally, I think recommended a Z1159 code and they made revisions to that in August as well. And they're basically saying now that a screening code is not really appropriate for this um, situation. Um, for encounters for testing, there are other guidelines that tell you how to code that. 
which we will talk about in a second, I believe. So if you have signs and symptoms without a definitive diagnosis, then you're obviously going to code those signs and symptoms, um, like cough, shortness of breath, fever, et cetera. If they have signs and symptoms that are associated with COVID and also have actual or suspected contact, then you're gonna use that Z20.828 code that we just talked about as an additional diagnosis. Asymptomatic individuals who test positive um, are still going to be coded as confirmed because if they've tested positive, they are still considered to have a COVID-19 infection. And then if they have a personal history of COVID-19, you're going to use the Z86.19 personal history of other infectious and parasitic diseases. For follow-up visits after the infection has resolved, um, if they're being seen for follow-up and the test results have now come back negative, you're going to use a Z09 code for that and then you would also want to use the Z86.19 to show that they had a history of the COVID-19 infection. If they're coming in for antibody testing that is not being performed to confirm a current infection or as a follow-up after somebody has had an infection, then you would be using this Z01.84 um, code. If they have follow-up testing after a code infection, then there's a different guideline that would guide you in how to code that. So moving along into chapter three, as I said, they made a lot of changes in the blood area, in particular to the sickle cell disease category. Previous codes, or actually the current codes, have not allowed us to really capture a lot of different complications to sickle cell disease, except for um, the acute chest syndrome and the splenic sequestration. And they also really were kind of treating this vaso-occlusive pain um, not really capturing that and often if a patient is not in crisis that's really the reason that they're coming in because of that vaso occlusive pain so they added some notes here to basically make it clear that that vaso occlusive pain is considered integral to um, this condition and it is really not a separate manifestation to be coded so they've added explanations throughout the categories but then you see we've got some breakdowns here to give us some additional um, complication categories. The first one being cerebral vascular involvement. And you note that there is a code also note that if they also have a cerebral infarction, that that would need to be coded out uh, in addition. And then we also have um, with crisis with other specified complications. So if you have something like cholelithiasis or priapism or some other things that they can find sometimes with these sickle cell patients, you have some additional, uh, an additional way to capture that. And then they have a use additional code note so that you would actually code out the, the specific complication and have that information to track. So you see that they've worked their way through all the different sickle cell codes doing this same issue that I just talked about. And then over here, same thing with the sickle cell thalassemia. Um, so all of these were, you know, broken down with the acute cyst chest syndrome and the splenic sequestration. Um, and then also the code also notes that I mentioned so that you can identify the specific complications um, of these breakdowns here. The other thing that they wanted to capture was um, there are two types of the sickle cell thalassemia. We only had one code. We only have one code currently, and there are two types that are really different from each other, the beta zero and the beta plus. So they wanted to, to separate out those codes and um, capture that information because they're clinically quite different. The beta zero is very similar to sickle cell SS disease in terms of how frequent and how severe um, their problems are and the types of chronic complications that they uh, experience. Um, the risk of stroke is very similar with that one as well. And they typically are able to manage those with um, hydroxyurea. However, the beta plus is much less severe and it has little or no anemia involved and the spectrum and severity of complications is much less. It has also a much lower risk of stroke. And most of those patients are not gonna require treatment with the hydroxyurea that the beta zero patients require. So again, they wanted to make sure that they could track 
the differences in clinically in those patients and how they respond to treatment. These sickle cell specificity codes are all pretty much MCCs, I believe. Um, you can see again, they've worked their way through with cerebrovascular and other specified throughout all of these things. And then they also gave us an additional breakdown on autoimmune hemolytic anemias. And there is an excludes one note here that was revised to excludes two, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, that, that was a lot of the changes that they made. And you can see that they've given us also a breakdown related to temperature. Um, there are basically four types of this uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. One is a drug induced and the other three are temperature sensitive, the warm, cold, and the mix that you see on the slide there. And that temperature denotes the temp at which the autoantibodies best react with the red blood cells. The warm type is when the autoantibody red blood cell binding is at 37 degrees centigrade. And in cold, that occurs below 37 degrees centigrade. Warm is gonna be the, the biggest population, about 70% of the cases fall into that particular category. But these patients with these um, different types of this hemolytic anemia have great risk of thromboembolic events such as pulmonary embolism, CVA, and MI. And the warm and the cold type have significant differences in the way those are treated. They usually use um, steroids to treat those that have the warm um, autoimmune hemolytic type, but the cold type, um, they don't find that the steroids are as effective with the cold. So I think that's one reason they wanna try to capture what's happening with those particular patients. And then you see also down here under the D61, the excludes one note there under aplastic anemia was revised to an excludes two note. Also, we have a, a bigger breakdown with eosinophilia. That generally means that you have elevated levels of eosinophils in your blood, which is one of the disease-fighting white blood cells. Again, we have an excludes one note that was revised to excludes two note here. And then we have some different types here. This idiopathic hyper eosinophilic syndrome, which is a lot to say, the IHES, accounts for approximately 70% of the patients that have this particular issue. And a lot of the times these pa patients with this eosinophilia will have um, end organ damage. Um, the largest organ system affected is usually the skin, but pulmonary, GI, cardiac, and nervous can also be affected fairly regularly. The first line of treatment for IHES patients is corticosteroids. The LHES, which stands for the lymphocytic variant um, syndrome, is where they have an aberrant T lymphocyte that produces cytokines such as interleukin-5. Um, the skin is the most frequently evolved organ system here as well. They have to have higher doses of corticosteroids to treat those and sometimes in combination with some uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Sometimes those cases will actually progress to uh, lymphoma. Then we have this last little category here, the EAE or Glykes syndrome. And those patients will have recurrent episodes of fever, angioedema, weight gain, and peripheral eosinophilia every four to six weeks. Um, some patients develop organ system involvement in lymphoma in that category as well. Then we have this new code for DRESS syndrome or the drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms syndrome. Again, I use additional code notice here for adverse effect if applicable to identify the drug that caused that syndrome. This is a severe life threat that threatening drug reaction characterized by widespread skin rash along with marked systemic symptoms, including fever, lymphadenopathy, facial edema and macular papular rash. Um, sometimes the systemic involvement can include the, the liver and the interstitial uh, tissue in the lungs. It can be triggered by either short or long-term exposure to drugs and they really want us to be able to use this, use additional code note to capture the drug causing this whenever this is coded out. The only change with this code down here is again the code first underlying condition and 
be reminded again that code first is a sequencing direction, meaning that you're going to code the underlying condition first and sequence that first, and then the D72 as a secondary diagnosis. This is um, some information taken from the uh, Coordination and Maintenance Committee minutes about immunodeficiency. They've made some revisions to that. We had a coding clinic that came out in 2015 that talked about the fact that we should not code immunocompromised state, that D89.9, when the patient was on immunosuppressant drugs. It should only be coded if no specific disease process or drug was identified. However, they were talking in the uh, CNM committee meeting in September of last year that obviously when you treat those immunocompromised patients, they are much more risky and challenging to treat. They usually require longer lengths of stay, greater resources, have more infections and complications, et cetera. So they want to make sure that that information gets captured so that they can sort of predict the severity and you know the cost of treating these patients. So basically what they did was to develop some new codes for that. And you can see here, um, we do have a code first to underlying condition and an excludes one note that have been added to this D84.81, which is immunodeficiency due to conditions classified elsewhere. And then we have one that is due to drugs and external causes. They have a use additional code note here to identify um, the adverse effect of the drug or if it's um, caused by long-term drug therapy. And then this next breakdown is due to external causes. And then they have a code also note here to try to capture what those code also might be, if it's radiological procedure, radiotherapy, um, or some other external cause. And under this last one, the D84.89, it's just where you would capture any other any immunodeficiencies that don't fall into these categories. And then of course, an unspecified one as well. Cytokine syndrome, uh, cytokine release syndrome has a new breakdown, and you can see that these are CCs. Um, the D8983 has a code first, the underlying cause note, and an additional code note for any associated manifestations. And then you can see that they have them broken down by grades, and I've put out here kind of the symptoms of the grades or the staging that comes with that. Um, grade one would be based. Basically, the fever, patient has a fever with a temp greater than 38 centigrade. Grade two would be fever with hypotension, not requiring vasopressors and or hypoxia, requiring low flow nasal oxygen. Grade three would be with hypotension with or without vasopressors press, press, and or hypoxia with high flow oxygen, which is greater than six liters a minute, and a face mask, a non-rebreather mask, or a venturi mask. And then grade four would be fever with hypotension with multiple vasopressors except for vasopressin and or hypoxia with CPAP BiPAP intubation and mechanical vent. And then grade five is basically defined as death due to cytokine release syndrome. Another interesting thing about that um, is that you, you find a, a lot of talk about the fact that that's one of the things that COVID-19 has caused is this cytokine uh, storm, basically, which is kind of the same thing um, that this is talking about, where those um, rapid release of cytokines in the blood in the blood from the immune cells that have been, you know, affected, just kind of overwhelms the patient in the in the different organ systems, and it can be a life-threatening, you know, multi-organ dysfunction. We've seen that with COVID patients, but this also occurs a lot of times in um, patients, especially young patients that are being treated with refractory uh, leukemia. So it's very important to be able to, to capture kind of the grade of this and how severe it is. These are just a list of the common um, manifestations that you might see associated with that cytokine release syndrome. Then we move on into the endocrine chapter. And you can see here just an index change where emaciation due to malnutrition was previously going to be coded to E41, and it's now going to be revised to E43, which is unspecified severe protein calorie malnutrition. Then we have an expansion of E70.8, um, disorders of aromatic amino acid metabolism. 
The first one here is this AADC, and that is a genetic autosomal recessive disorder that causes severe combined deficiency of dopamine and serotonin, as well as norepinephrine and epinephrine. And as you probably are aware of, dopamine is responsible for a lot of different things. In fact, all of these are. Dopamine monitors or regulates the cognitive function, voluntary movement, and emotions. Serotonin regulates basal functions, mood, sleep, memory, and learning, and body temp. The epinephrine and norepinephrine control mood, sleep patterns, cognition, and stress hormones. So the defined combined deficiencies of these different things um, cause some major symptoms um, like hypotonia, hypokinesia, um, dystonia, developmental delay, failure to thrive, ptosis, excessive sweating, etc. Many times patients will get this in the first few months of life and often they'll die within the first 10 years of life. So it's very important to try to capture this information as quickly as possible. Another one that you see in the second uh, expansion is the GLUT1 deficiency. This is another genetic disorder of brain metabolism where the glucose does not reach and fuel the brain properly. And it can cause a lot of symptoms as well, infecting intellectual disability, developmental delay, seizures, motor dysfunction, speak and speech and language, just a lot of things. They treat these patients often with a ketogenic diet because ketones provide an alternate, alternate source of brain energy when they're not able to process the glucose correctly. So again, they wanna make sure that they can capture this and follow that appropriately as well. Then you see a few things here where we've got excludes ones changed to excludes twos. We have a guideline here. Um, they've just added this injectable non-insulin drugs and they're basically following the guidelines we've had before that if they're on, you know, if they're on insulin and they also are giving them an injectable non-insulin, they want you to code Z79.4 and the Z Z79899, um, you know, with Insulin and oral hypoglycemics, we're only supposed to code the insulin, but in this case, they want to capture both of those. And they've done the same thing when they're on oral hypoglycemics to code the Z79-84 and the Z79-899. Same thing in the secondary diagnoses, same exact guideline given there. Now we have some big changes in the alcohol um, and drug use and abuse area. We typically have not had any withdrawal codes for alcohol or drug use and abuse. Um, the reason for that being that they really did not feel like um, withdrawal was an issue when a patient, unless a patient was dependent. And I think we've had guidelines that said if you know they have withdrawal, then you can assume that that's a dependence situation. But they're finding with some of these um, drugs and even with alcohol that a patient can develop dependence um, and go into withdrawal even when they don't technically meet the definition of dependent. Um, if they have a situation where the patient is using that substance regularly and then suddenly stops, but they don't have a diagnosis of, de of dependence, they can still go into withdrawal. Um, this can include a patient that takes prescribed medicines on a daily basis who becomes physiologically and addicted but does not have behavioral elements required for a diagnosis of dependence. And patients who abuse substances regularly, um, which qualifies for substance abuse, but don't have the loss of control required for dependence. So the American Psychiatric Association asked that we have these additional codes to capture withdrawal for these patients that don't meet the technical definition of dependence, but do have that physiological addiction. Primarily, these are CCs with the exception of this one in the middle, the cannabis abuse with withdrawal. Uh, and just a little extra addition to this guideline here. Um, this actually came out as an instruction in a coding clinic in first quarter 20. Um, but they were asking for some explanation about what these other um, physical disorders were, and it's defining those as those that are included in chapter five, such as sexual dysfunction, and sleep disorder. So not just any kind of physical disorder, but specifically those types. Then in the ner nervous system, again, most of these are CCs. Um, we have some additional um, 
breakdown of cerebellar ataxia, early onset, and then um, a specific code for Friedrich ataxia, also known as FA or FRDA. This particular ataxia is a multi-system neurological disorder with progressive symptoms of gait imbalance, instability, impaired coordination that affects all the muscles, dysarthria, scoliosis, loss of sensation, cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmias, diabetes, hearing and vision loss. Um, it affects brain development and cognitive functioning, um, but most of the time those are, you know, fairly well preserved, much more so than the first part things that I talked about. Usually people develop Friedrich's ataxia between age 10 and 16, and because of the unique symptoms that are related to FA, such as cardiomyopathy and diabetes, they wanted to specifically track that code and separate it out from the others. Then we have um, a use additional code note that was added under G20 Parkinson disease when they have dementia. Then we have a new code for this CDKL5, cyclin-dependent kinase-like 5 deficiency disorder. I use additional code note to identify the manifestations. This is also a developmental encephalopathy caused by variants in the gene CDKL5. It usually presents with early um, infantile refractory epilepsy, hypotonia, developmental intellectual and motor disabilities, etc. It can affect swallowing and um, the GI system as well, can cause um, scoliosis, etc. And unlike regular epilepsy, this can greatly affect the, the patient's vision. So they, again, want to make sure that they can separate this out from the other types of um, epilepsy in terms of how it's treated and how it's monitored. And then this Dravet syndrome here is some additional codes and you see a breakdown with and without status epilepticus, excuse me. This used to be known as severe myoclonic epilepsy in infancy or SEMI. SMEI, I'm sorry, and it's also a genetic encephalopathy that presents in the first year of life. Only about seven, or it represents about 7% of all severe epilepsies presenting before the age of three. And then it excludes two note added under this headache code. Then we have a breakdown for congenital myopathies. The excludes note was changed to excludes two, and then we have congenital nemaline centronuclear, and then a further breakdown of that. Um, I don't know a lot about this particular um, category, unfortunately, but if you are coding in a pediatric hospital, um, for example, then you need to be aware of these more specific codes. We also have a re revision of a note under G92, toxic encephalopathy, to code first if applicable, applicable both the drug-induced or use, or to identify the toxic agent. Then in the, going on to the next um, area here, we have an excludes one note added under this intracranial hypertension. We have an excludes one revised to excludes two under this toxic encephalopathy. And then we have a breakdown about um, CSF leaks. It's clinically important to differentiate between spontaneous CSF leaks and other CSF leaks, and to differentiate between cranial and spinal. So you can see here that I've underlined the different things in these codes to highlight cranial and spinal and spontaneous so that you can make sure that you are carefully looking for that if you find yourself needing to um, code those. We also have code additional note for intracranial hypotension noted throughout all of these um, categories. Here we have the new codes for intracranial hypotension. We also have a code also, any associated diagnosis note added, which would be some of those things on the previous slide. And then we have unspecified, spontaneous, and other. Intracranial hypotension does result from spontaneous loss of CSF fluid volume, and it's often under-recognized and under-diagnosed. It's most often associated with fluid leaks at the spinal level and not the cranial level. Um, and the causes, often it can be caused by atrogenic holes or defects in the spinal dura from a diagnostic or therapeutic spinal tap for inadvertent spinal dural puncture during, during an injection, epidural injection, 
or involvement or intentional spinal durotomies during spinal surgeries. It can also be caused by overdrainage of CSF fluid with a shunt, or it can be caused by traumatic spinal dural tears um, that result in a CSF leak. So again, that same breakdown is added under all of these codes. And then again, these additional, this, this specific code for this hypotension following a lumbar cerebral spinal fluid shunting or following another procedure. In the eye, we just have a lot of things related to these corneal dystrophy codes, expanded for laterality, and you can see all the different categories of the different types of dystrophies that have all been expanded for laterality. And then the only other thing here is um, this change to this code that they have renamed um, to deficient saccadic eye movements. And that is an anomaly of smooth pursuit eye movements. And that's something that the uh, Optometry Association um, required that they um, develop a code for that they could start tracking that. In the circulatory system, first we have this um, change to the uh, under hypertensive heart disease. This actually got changed in coding clinic um, a, a, in. 2018 to account for the code number for Takotsubo syndrome, um, which is not considered a hypertensive heart disease. So now they're bringing the guideline in that to reflect the categories that are listed here to make sure that these are the ones that are automatically linked into the I-11 category with hypertension. They also revised this um, excludes one cardiogenic shock code to excludes two, so that if you have a cardiac arrest, and cardiogenic shock occur together that you can code them together. And then a cerebral infarction excludes one because we have a new code for neonatal cerebral infarction that we'll be talking about in a little bit. And then the rest of these are really what they have done to add information about chronic limb threatening ischemia or critical limb ischemia. And if you've done any um, peripheral bypass coding or anything like that, you'll see that frequently do documented in the charts. Um, they basically are telling us that that is, you know, kind of included in all of these I-70 codes. Um, so they've done it for native arteries, bypass arteries, et cetera, um, to make sure that you um, understand that. And basically that is a clinical syndrome identified by the presence of peripheral arterial disease or peripheral vascular disease, however you want to call it, with rest pain, uh, gangrene, or a lower limb ulceration greater than two weeks. And again, you'll see that frequently in patients that have either amputations or bypasses because of critical limb ischemia. And then they just revised this and added a sentence here to make it more clear that if you have um, acute renal failure along with CKD, hypertensive CKD, um, that you should code both separately and that the sequencing is going to be determined by the sequences or the circumstances of the admission. The respiratory system, um, just it has an exclude one note that was revised um, under these code categories. And then a code also note here, um, some explanatory phrases here. And then emphysema, they've done an excludes one to excludes note here. And then um, they've added this diagnosis to and a use additional code note under that J45 category. Again, a one note changed to a two under this J70.5 category and a code first note. Again, important to know what these instructions are as a part of the classification so that you make sure that you get all of that coded appropriately. And then this pulmonary eosinophilia, we talked about eosinophilia back in chapter three changes, but this is specifically related to pulmonary. And obviously that means that the um, elevated levels of eosinophils infiltrate into the lung tissue. And we have an excludes one change to an excludes two. And then we have a breakdown showing chronic acute and then eosinophilic asthma. These are very different from each other. The acute um, has rapidly progressive respiratory failure, usually less than one month. They often have to go to the ICU and put on a vent 
Um, and basically it's diagnosed with lung washings from a bronchoalveolar lavage. And it has been linked to new onset cigarette smoking or increase in smoking. The chronic situation has slower progression, um, does not usually progress to acute respiratory failure, but they have frequent relapses and often um, can be associated with asthma. This one is basically diagnosed by bronchoscopy washings with findings of increased eosinophils. And um, they can have um, wheezing develop um, as part of that asthma relation there. And then the eosinophilic asthma has a code first uh, at the type of asthma by um, type. You know, the asthma codes are broken down by um, persistence, severity and persistence and presence of exacerbation, but this is a separate defined subset of asthma that they want to be able to capture. This is the leading cause of severe asthma and it affects about 50 to 60 percent of the people that have for severe forms of asthma and it can be very difficult to treat and really have a detrimental impact on their, their life. So they want to make sure that that gets fully separated out so that they can track what's going on. There are some new drugs that are coming out waiting FDA approval for, to treat this type of asthma, so they want to make sure that they can identify the patient population that can benefit from those new treatments. And then we also have some things related to interstitial lung disease. They have sort of a new um, subset that they've identified, this progressive fibrotic phenotype. And um, those patients often have um, poor prognosis. And so they want to make sure that they can capture um, that one kind of separately and unique because it often has early mortality um, more so than the other types. Then we have a guideline related to the vaping disorders. This came out uh, earlier in the year as well, but now is incorporated into the category um, for how to code that to the UO 7.0 and then coding out those separate manifestations of that. The digestive system, um, you know, the with bleed codes are usually MCCs. We haven't had the ability to code with bleed with esophagitis or GERD. Um, codes or, uh, you know, other types of esophagitis. So we're giving the, we are now having the ability to code a with bleed with these different types of um, esophagitis. Then we have, you know, excludes one to excludes two note here. And this one is a little bit interesting where it's basically saying that if you have an unspecified intestinal obstruction, the excludes one note that said intestinal obstruction due to specified condition code the condition has been deleted. I recently had a, a coding situation where the patient had um, an obstruction uh, in cancer, and the you know, question came about, you know, which one is coded because they they did you know some surgery on it, and I'm going to be interested to see if we get some coding uh, guideline refer or coding refer clinic references that help explain a little bit about how this might be treated now that they've deleted that code. They also basically um, separated out peritonitis from these diverticulitis codes. It's no longer going to be considered integral. In I-9, we coded peritonitis out separately, so we'll have to wait and see whether they come out with some coding clinic references about um, coding this out separately now that it's not considered integral to those codes any longer. Then we have um, some new codes. Uh, Ogilvy syndrome is an acquired disorder of involuntary rhythmic muscular contractions in the colon, and it can mimic a mechanical obstruction or blockage of the colon even when there is no obstruction. And if it's untreated, undiagnosed and untreated, it can be life-threatening. So they want to make sure they can, you know, identify that. And then we also have um, this uh, NASH down here. We've got, as you can see, a breakdown for hepatic fibrosis with, with the stages. Um, didn't mean to skip over that. And it has a code first underlying disease such as NASH. Stage one would be parasinusoidal sin sinusoidal or periportal. Stage two would be parasinusoidal and portal. And then stage three would be bridging fibrosis or pre-cirrhosis. And then stage four is considered cirrhosis. So be aware of those um, different stages that are 
available to code hepatic fibrosis. And then we have the new code for NASH that we were just referring to up here. Um, and NASH is, is um, causes fat to build up in the liver and it causes lead inflammation and fibrosis, which can ultimately lead to cirrhosis and liver failure. Um, often these patients are not diagnosed until they reach end stage liver disease. And they, the gold standard for diagnosing is a liver biopsy, but they're hoping that they can um, identify these more quickly because they've developed some non-invasive tests that they think will help them assess the stages that we've got in these earlier codes to try to get to this patient and identify them before they progress to these later stages. Then we have um, other specified site options added in the musculoskeletal system for all these different codes. So just that's all I'm going to say about that. We've got laterality built into these um, temporal mandibular arthritis of the joint. Same thing for this category here. And then we also have um, age-related osteoporosis and other osteoporosis, other site specifications. We had a lot of different um, bone sites included in these M80 codes, but not um, the mandible and the maxible, maxilla or some other fractures that we might find these pathological fractures. So they wanted to give us some additional options for that. Then we also have laterality built into this juvenile osteochondrosis. And then we have some additional breakdowns. This actual code has been revised um, from this juvenile osteochondrosis of the tibia and fibula right leg to juvenile osteochondrosis of the proximal tibia, which is also known as blunt disease with a laterality exp expansion. And this one of the left leg revised to juvenile osteochondrosis of the tibia tubercle or Osgood slatter with a laterality um, situation. The blunt disease is a growth disorder of the tibia that causes the leg to angle inward and resembling a bow leg, which affects growing children. And the Osgood slatter is characterized by soreness and swelling at the typical tuberosity, which occurs in adolescence. In the GU system, we have a, a lot of changes with um, trying to capture this C3 glomerular nephritis or C3GN. Um, these NO and NO1 codes are actually uh, MCCs, the others are in, uh, CCs, but in addition to um, adding that with the G3, C3GN, we have these um, new codes. We already had some codes showing dense deposit disease. There's basically two types, the C3, GN and the dense deposit disease, but now they've separated out these new point A codes so that you can separate out the, the different types um, and capture that information. C3 is a blood protein that plays a key role in, in normal uh, immunity. And the C3 uh, GN is basically kind of a newly classified uncommon kidney disorder. And the, the two distinct subtypes, as I said, the C3 GN and the dense deposit disease. Um, but it can ca cause inflammation of the kidney glomeruli, which filter out the blood, which affects the ability to maintain electrolyte imbalance and remove waste, et cetera. So they really want to make sure they can code those out separately. We also have a breakdown, an additional breakdown for stage three CKD. And it's based on the GFR rankings. So 3A would be GFR 45 to 59 and 3B would be 30 to 44. And then we have new codes for a different type of mastitis that's different than the other types. It's kind of rare, it's chronic and inflammatory. Uh, it's often not diagnosed for a long time or mistreated um, because physicians don't recognize it for what it is. And it can be a real challenge for the patient and the, treat, the treating physician. So they wanna make sure they can capture that separately. In the OB area, we have a new code breakdown so that we could capture this isthmocele specificity. This is um, the isthmocele is a result of incomplete healing of the isthmic myometrium after a low transverse C-section. It can be asymptomatic, but it can also cause um, menstrual abnormalities, pelvic pain, secondary infertility, et cetera. So they wanted to capture that separately. 
And then with this kind of non-specific or other specified diseases and conditions, they wanted to make sure that they separated it out so you could tell if it occurred during pregnancy, childbirth, or the puerperum. Then we have a guideline for OB about puerperal sepsis um, that 085 would not be assigned for sepsis following an obstetrical procedure. Um, see the section on sepsis due to post-procedural infection. There is a coding clinic that already came out about that as well, so it's now been incorporated into the guidelines. And then we have the COVID guidelines basically stating that the U07 would not be first listed for OB patients, but the 098.5 code would be instead, which is consistent with the other OB guidelines that we have. And same thing basically with the newborns. It's got guidelines for how to code that. And of course, if it's diagnosed during the um, birth episode, the Z38 would be your principal diagnosis in that case. The only thing I'm going to really talk about on this slide is the neonatal cerebral infarction. I mentioned we had a new code that we saw excludes one notes and two notes um, in earlier slides. These are MCCs and they're basically wanting to capture um, where it occurs. Most of these occur in the uh, left or right middle cerebral artery, but they want to be able to capture um, you know, where it's actually occurring in the brain to track that in those babies. Then we have some malformation kind of revisions um, to the wording on these things, which I won't really go into. Signs and symptoms, um, they've expanded the headache codes. And then this one in particular, the, um, they've separated out some of the liver enzymes because they mean different things clinically and they're treated in different ways. So the first breakdown, the 0.01 would be um, capturing the transaminases, AST and ALT, those are often used to screen for liver injuries, whereas the lactic acid dehydrogenase um, basically um, indicates possibly neoplasm. So they want to make sure that they can code out separately which enzymes are actually elevated in order to know, you know, what types of thing, testing and treatment for those patients. In the injury area, the main thing here is capturing some specificity about these chest wall injuries. A lot of the blunt trauma, high energy injuries that we see in vehicle collisions do happen in the chest. They wanna capture whether it's front or back wall of the thorax and whether it's bilateral, middle, middle, et cetera. So they've gotten that specificity all throughout um, these categories. Poisoning, they deleted this whole category, T40.4, which is grouping all the synthetic narcotics into one group. They want to separate them out. So we're separating out the codes for fentanyl or fentanyl analogs, and then tramadol, and then other synthetic narcotics. And you can see the breakdown here would be the same with these codes. Obviously, the fentanyl and fentanyl um, analogs are responsible for a large number of the opioid deaths that we're seeing. But this tramadol, you know, um, can be a, an issue as well. So they want to make sure that they can, you know, follow these things and track them um, because they have different um, prevention met methods to deal with those different um, types of synthetic drugs. Traumatic um, subcutaneous emphysema excludes one to two. And then we have some um, bilateral or laterality for the transplant reduction of the corneal transplant. Those are CCs. And then a lot of changes in the e-codes just to try to, or the external cause codes actually, to um, capture electric scooters um, as pedestrian conveyances and to separate out standing things like rotor blades or skateboards versus something where the patient is riding in it. So all of those changes are relating to those two issues right there. And then the only thing here is, um, tracking issues with contact lenses where they have adverse event, events or infections. They want to be able to track that more, more closely. We have some additional code breakdown for observation for suspected foreign bodies. A lot of times if a baby swallows something, um, they can't tell you about it and they end up having to do all kinds of, you know, examination and testing to try to find out if, if there's a foreign body and they want to have a way to capture that code 
so that they can, you know, bill for those resources and the time that's expended looking for the foreign body. So that's the reason for this breakdown here. And then they made some changes to the Z79 category in the code classification or code range under this personal history of, of this type of malignant neoplasm. Observation, um, just a new guideline change where those are going to be primarily first listed diagnosis, it can be assigned as a secondary diagnosis when the patient's observed that it, for a condition that's ruled out and unrelated to the principal, et cetera. Vaping, we've already um, talked a little bit about this. These are the new codes for vaping that came out October or April 1st, rather, and the new codes for COVID-19 that came out April 1st as well, and all the different use additional code notes that are going along with those two codes. And then just the guideline that's talking about this chapter being used for special purposes and with the two, the two new codes that we just talked about. Then just one little word change in this outpatient um, guideline here related to provider. So last but not least, because we're just about out of time, or we are out of time, um, I'll just tell you that the um, final rule that came out, um, this slide shows you just sort of a recap of some of the changes just to make you aware of those things. And we don't really have time to go over them and I apologize for that. And then this next slide, the last thing that I wanted to show you, this is sort of a slide that just talks about the impact of all the quality-based programs. We are moving more and more to the hospital value-based program, as you know. We have quality reporting, we have value-based purchasing measures, we have um, reduction in readmission rates and hospital-acquired conditions. This slide shows you sort of the payment loss in these different areas if you don't do well on those measures. And the reason that I put this here was to help people understand that these are based on coded claims data. So your coding has a great impact on all of these areas. And in addition to correct coding, many of these are risk adjusted based on HCCs, which many coders are still not coding. Um, and so it's, and there are other risk adjustment things out there. So it's very important that you start paying attention to um, coding not only what meets a secondary diagnosis, but whether it falls into an HCC category or not, making sure those get sequenced on the claim because the HCCs and the risk adjustment not only can um, help you with your risk adjustment itself, but it can also sometimes um, eliminate you from a particular, um, like a PSA, patient safety indicator or measure so that you don't meet that measure any longer. And I apologize for running over just a bit, um, but I'll turn it over now to um, Sharon. Thank you very much, Joy. We appreciate all that great information. Um, I just want to review with everyone a, a reminder that tomorrow I will be sending out an email. It will contain a link to this recording, the handout. Um, it will also contain the link that you're seeing on this uh, slide right here, and that's how you can obtain your CEU. So you can click on this link, complete a brief evaluation, and you'll be able to download your CEU certificate. And again, if you have any issues, feel free to send me an email, and I will make sure that you get what you need. And for all of those people who submitted questions, thank you so much. Um, apologies, we couldn't get to them, but I, we will pass them on to Joy, and um, she'll get an answer to you, and we'll, we'll make sure we get those to your inboxes. So stay tuned for those. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.